and machines, these are nothing so much as small cities at sea. But ever since carriers start appearing on the scene, the Navy has had a problem. For years, naval aviation really wanted to have twin engine capability in, in an environment where you're going long distances over water for a safety point of view. But the snag was it was not possible to land a twin-engined aircraft back on an aircraft carrier if it had had an engine, one engine failure, and you had an asymmetric situation to deal with. Because as the speed got lower, they, you lost control, directional control, of the aircraft. It just, there just wasn't enough rudder power. Landing on the deck of a moving ship is hard enough, even under the best of conditions, but trying to do so with an unbalanced plane, constantly pitching to one side, is nearly impossible. Many pilots are told to forget about trying to land and simply eject close to the ship, leaving their plane to sink into the ocean abyss. And yet, two engines are exactly what is needed for the long-haul missions these planes must perform. If nothing else, Four years of deadly warfare in the Atlantic have proven once and for all the strategic importance of submarines. It is a lesson that Britain will not soon forget. So in 1945, the Admiralty issues order GR-1745 for a carrier-borne anti-submarine aircraft. Only two ideas are given serious consideration, one from Blackburn and one from Ferry. It is not long before Ferry's innovative design wins the day. Enter the gannet. This was a brilliant concept because you had a twin-engined aircraft um, in effect in a single-engine form where you had two, two engines, uh, turboprop engines side by side. Um, each could operate independently if one failed, and um, you had still, in effect, for landing, if one failed, you were landing on a single engine aircraft with one aircraft, with one engine, just as you'd been used to throughout all the other aircraft that were used by the Navy. So there was no problem there. Very effective. And besides that, it was a very good design. It had a very capacious bomb bay, um, and it was dead easy to deck land. It was ideal for deck landing, so there was much to be said for it. The Gannet's greatest strength is its ingenious engine configuration. Two Armstrong Siddeley Mamba engines are mounted together. This, in turn, causes two contra-rotating propellers, one behind the other, to spin. The end result is that the plane can run on only one engine and still remain centered. This configuration is known as the twin mamba. The long-standing problem of twin-engine naval aircraft has been solved. With the Cold War quickly ramping up, priority is placed on perfecting the Gannett's design. In September of 1949, the first prototype takes flight. Some months later, in the summer of 1950, the Gannett becomes the first turboprop aircraft to make a carrier landing. Its primary role is patrol for Soviet submarines along the North Atlantic, the very place where pitched battles against German U-boats had been fought a decade earlier. If the Cold War turns hot, Soviet subs in the Atlantic could wreak massive damage on both sea and land. One of the main choke points through which they would need to pass is the so-called GIUK, or Greenland-Iceland-United Kingdom Gap. It is the only approach into the Atlantic from the submarine bases in the Kola Peninsula. So naturally, this is where defences must be concentrated. And for this, a fleet of gannets are needed. For an American system of underwater hydrophones named SOSIS, and designed to pinpoint Soviet subs in the GIUK Gap, is not yet operational. 
But midway through the gannet's life cycle, a new threat emerges. One that makes its job all the more crucial. By the late 50s, a new class of submarines are starting to appear. Nuclear armed and nuclear powered. Able to stay submerged for months and launch surprise attacks without a moment's notice. In the age of nuclear arms, such submarines become the ultimate weapon. Deep beneath the waves, this silent enemy lurks, carrying with it the means to reduce entire cities to ash. As Soviet subs prowl the world's oceans, tracking and destroying becomes top priority. Never has a reliable anti-submarine aircraft been in greater demand. Over 250 units are delivered to the fleet air arm. They serve on the HMS Eagle, HMS Ark Royal and other carriers. Throughout the late 50s, the Gannet continues to be developed, and it soon finds itself in great demand. It is sold to Allied navies around the world, helping keep their seas clear of enemy submarines. The Royal Australian Navy, the Indonesian Naval Air Arm and the West German Bundesmarine each have their squadrons equipped by the capable Gannet. Double folding wings help keep its profile small, for on a carrier, no matter how large, space is always at a premium. And those, like Germany without aircraft carriers of their own, are by no means short-changed. The Gannet is equally capable on land as on sea. Indeed, one of their main staging areas is at RNAS Abbotsink in Scotland. So versatile is it, in fact, that it is trusted with the important role of airborne early warning. In the late 50s, 44 aircraft of the AEW Mark III model enter service. Initially, it was going to be an anti-submarine warfare aircraft, but it then moved on to the probably the much more important duty of airborne early warning and um, also night, night, um, night operations. So it was a very, very useful aircraft indeed. But even usefulness has its limits. The Cold War arms race demands constant evolution. By the mid-1960s, the Royal Navy is beginning to introduce helicopters as their main anti-submarine warfare craft. They are easy to land on carriers and can freely loiter over an area of interest. The Gannet is retired and gives way to the Western Whirlwind. In its airborne early warning role, the Gannet is replaced by the Avro Shackleton. So that its powerful AN-APS-20 radar units do not go to waste, they are stripped off and installed on the Shackleton. The Gannet stays in service a while longer, flying cargo to and from Britain's ocean-borne fortresses, the Titanic carriers it once defended. The Gannet Type is the world's oldest turboprop. They, they came into service in 1953, it's a single one. Now this aeroplane now is the, the only, the oldest turboprop flying in the world of any turboprop. This particular Mark, which is a T5 dual control version, only eight were ever built. And this was the prototype, this was the first. The left engine turns the front propeller and the, the right engine turns the rear propeller. 
and they're totally independent. They share the same oil system, but they're totally independent. So when I'm flying the aeroplane, I have total autonomy. I can shut one engine down, I can stop each propeller in flight, I can then feather each propeller depending on what I want to do. You can't really change the fuel flow because they're, they're turbine and they're constant speed. So she's burning about 200 gallons an hour no matter what you do. If you imagine when you turn your faucet on at home, the fuel is running into these quicker than you see your faucet running. If I shut one engine down, then I can, I can elongate the, the length of time I stay up in the air, but you're right. But by the time you see it start up here and I've taken off, I've burnt 50 gallons. Uh, I've got an endurance with both engines running about three and a half hours. And then, uh, but I can go up to speeds of 300 miles an hour. And then with one engine running, I can get to about 170 miles an hour with about five hours endurance. Because I can shut either engine down in flight and fly on one engine deliberately. It was a, a, a sub hunter for the, for the Cold War, for search and destroy effectively Russian submarines, which was the threat at the time. You've got uh, the main, at the front of the main bay, you've got two 2,000 pound torpedoes. Behind that, it was the world's first nuclear capable sub hunter. So you've got four 200 pound nuclear depth charges. Then you've got sonar boys and flare markers that would be dropped from the bomb bay to listen for the subs underneath. And then on the wings, you have 16 rockets. So if you had to attack the sub on the surface of the water, it would do that. So it could, ca it could catch a sub either if it was submerged or above. Well, you'll see when we start up is that we'll start up using the front engine because we've got a nitrogen that will air start the front engine because we don't have electric start. It's either a big cannon shell that will start it through a turbo starter or we'll put nitrogen on and that's where we do it all the time now. So when you'll see the front one start and when I've got that all settled down, then we'll start the second one up and I'll start it through the wind of the front one. So I'll open this up to about three quarter power and the wind coming off of it, the slipstream, will then wind the second one up and then I can put fuel into it and start the second one through the, 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 uh, the slipstream of the front one. When I'm sitting in the cockpit, I can select down, spread, and, and it'll all automatically do everything itself. So when you see it open up, it's doing it all itself. And when it's doing it, it's not only just opening up the wings, it's pressurizing the wing for fuel because there's fuel in the midsection wings so it's pressurizing the, the fuel system it's opened up valves to get the fuel feed from those wings into the center of the wings there's seven tanks in the aeroplane it's then connecting all the flaps up and the ailerons up as it's as it's moving everything's connecting itself up it's it's amazing this aeroplane is is the um, the last gannet in the world to land on an aircraft carrier in the military it was selected by the admiralty to say farewell to all the gannet types in the world and it landed on our biggest aircraft carrier in the UK called the Ark Royal. And it landed on there in 1978. And uh, after that, they were all decommissioned and the Ark Royal was scrapped. Cutting across vast expanses of water, steel behemoths patrolled the oceans and seas. Packed densely with men and machines, these are nothing so much as small cities at sea. But ever since carriers start appearing on the scene, the Navy has had a problem. For years, naval aviation really wanted to have twin engine capability in, in an environment where you're going long distances over water for a safety point of view. But the snag was it was not possible to land a twin engine aircraft back on an aircraft carrier if it had had an engine, one engine failure and you had an asymmetric situation to deal with because as the speed got lower, they, you lost control, directional control of the aircraft. It just, there just wasn't enough rudder power there. Landing on the deck of a moving ship is hard enough, even under the best of conditions, but trying to do so with an unbalanced plane, constantly pitching to one side, is nearly impossible. Many pilots are told to forget about trying to land and simply eject close to the ship, leaving their plane to sink into the ocean abyss. 
And yet, two engines are exactly what is needed for the long-haul missions these planes must perform. If nothing else, four years of deadly warfare in the Atlantic have proven once and for all the strategic importance of submarines. It is a lesson that Britain will not soon forget. So in 1945, the Admiralty issues order GR-1745 for a carrier-borne anti-submarine aircraft. Only two ideas are given serious consideration, one from Blackburn and one from Ferry. It is not long before Ferry's innovative design wins the day. Enter the Gannet. This was a brilliant concept because you had a twin-engined aircraft um, in effect in a single-engine form. Well, you had two, two engines, uh, turboprop engines, side by side. Um, each could operate independently if one failed. And um, you had still, in effect, for landing, if one failed, you were landing on a single-engine aircraft with one aircraft with one engine, just as you'd been used to throughout all the other aircraft that were used by the Navy. So there was no problem there. Very effective. And besides that, it was a very good design. It had a very capacious bomb bay. Um, and it was dead easy to deck land. It was ideal for deck landing. So there was much to be said for it. The Gannet's greatest strength is its ingenious engine configuration. Two Armstrong Siddeley Mamba engines are mounted together. This in turn causes two contra-rotating propellers, one behind the other, to spin. The end result is that the plane can run on only one engine and still remain centered. This configuration is known as the Twin Mamba. The long-standing problem of twin-engine naval aircraft has been solved. With the Cold War quickly ramping up, priority is placed on perfecting the Gannet's design. In September of 1949, the first prototype takes flight. Some months later, in the summer of 1950, the Gannet becomes the first turboprop aircraft to make a carrier landing. Its primary role is patrol for Soviet submarines along the North Atlantic, the very place where pitched battles against German U-boats had been fought a decade earlier. If the Cold War turns hot, Soviet subs in the Atlantic could wreak massive damage on both sea and land. One of the main choke points through which they would need to pass is the so-called GIUK, or Greenland, Iceland, United Kingdom Gap. It is the only approach into the Atlantic from the submarine bases in the Kola Peninsula. So naturally, this is where defences must be concentrated. And for this, a fleet of gannets are needed. For an American system of underwater hydrophones named SOSIS, and designed to pinpoint Soviet subs in the GIUK gap, is not yet operational. But midway through the gannets' life cycle, a new threat emerges. One that makes its job all the more crucial. By the late 50s, a new class of submarines are starting to appear nuclear-armed and nuclear-powered, able to stay submerged for months and launch surprise attacks without a moment's notice. In the age of nuclear arms, such submarines become the ultimate weapon. Deep beneath the waves, this silent enemy lurks, carrying with it the means to reduce entire cities to ash. As Soviet subs prowl the world's oceans, tracking and destroying becomes top priority. Never has a reliable anti-submarine aircraft been in greater demand. Over 250 units are delivered to the fleet air arm. They serve on the HMS Eagle, HMS Ark Royal and other carriers. Throughout the late 50s, the Gannet continues to be developed, and it soon finds itself in great demand. It is sold to Allied navies around the world, helping keep their seas clear of enemy submarines. The Royal Australian Navy the Indonesian Naval Air Arm and the West German Bundesmarine each have their squadrons equipped by the capable gannet. Double folding wings help keep its profile small, for on a carrier, no matter how large, space is always at a premium. And those, like Germany without aircraft carriers of their own, are by no means shortchanged. 
The gannet is equally capable on land as on sea. Indeed, one of the main staging areas is at Arrhenaeus Abbotsink in Scotland. So versatile is it, in fact, that it is trusted with the important role of airborne early warning. In the late 50s, 44 aircraft of the AEW Mark III model enter service. Initially, it was going to be an anti-submarine warfare aircraft, but it then moved on to the, probably the much more important duty of airborne early warning. And... Um, and also night, night, um, night operations. So it was a very, very useful aircraft indeed. But even usefulness has its limits. The Cold War arms race demands constant evolution. By the mid-1960s, the Royal Navy is beginning to introduce helicopters as their main anti-submarine warfare craft. They are easy to land on carriers, and can freely loiter over an area of interest. The gannet is retired and gives way to the western whirlwind. In its airborne early warning role, the gannet is replaced by the Avro Shackleton. So that its powerful AN APS-20 radar units do not go to waste, they are stripped off and installed on the Shackleton. The gannet stays in service a while longer, flying cargo to and from Britain's ocean-borne fortresses, the Titanic carriers it once defended. You cannot place statues or build memorials in thin air. These airplanes, rescued, restored, returned to the sky, are the memorials. Through them, we give enduring thanks to those who gave everything they had to defend everything that we hold dear. By sharing them, we remind each other of the sacrifice. By sharing them, we introduce our heirs to their heritage. One week each summer, these national treasures are flown here. Twice each day, those who restored them present them to those who risk their lives to fight in them. And those who really did it tell the rest of us how it really was. It is a singular series of history lessons that anyone who cherishes liberty ought to see.
During World War II, the British Admiralty recognized the need for a new aircraft that could find and attack submarines. In 1946, the Royal Navy contracted with Ferry Aircraft to build one of the most unusual looking airplanes uh, to ever take part in any submarine operations, the Ferry Gannett. Well, during Warbirds in Review, the sole remaining airworthy Gannett was presented. The story of its history and restoration was told by its support crew and pilots, with flight crew member Paul Rankin starting off with the thinking behind its unconventional design. The basic concept was to get two engine performance and power, but real estate on an aircraft carrier is very valuable. So a twin engine airplane was not practical. So they came up with this concept so they would have twin engine power and performance in a single engine profile. The aircraft carriers were at that time straight deck the elevators were in the middle of the flight deck. So it was difficult to get a large airplane down that tiny hole. And that's where the strange wing fold system came. Once they got it down into the hangar deck, if they had only folded it in one place, it would have been too tall to fit in the hangar deck. The twin engine system gave the pilots the safety and performance they needed and gave them the ability to extend their range in a very novel manner. After launch, they would take off, fly to their working uh, area, and then to save fuel, let's shut one engine down, fly around on one engine, and every so often they would restart and shut down the other engine to keep the engine wear and tear fairly equal. It saved fuel. The power required for loitering is about half of what it needs for takeoff, so that worked quite well. So by doing that, they'd get extra flight time from the same fuel. The uh, engine is actually two engines driving a planetary gearbox that is then through coaxial shafts to the propellers. Now there are three terms that get bantered about, about this type of propeller. One is counter-rotating. That is where each propeller on two different engines rotates in the opposite direction, such as the P-38, Piper Seneca's, and so on. That's not this. The other term is contra-rotating. That would be one engine driving the two propellers. That's not this either. This is coaxial. Each engine is independent, drives its own propeller through coaxial shafts. And it works quite well. The Gannett used a method to start its engine that is not common today. A cartridge was loaded into a receptacle and ignited. Upon ignition, rapidly expanding gas drove the starter, uh, bringing the engine's turbine up to speed so fuel could be introduced and ignited, completing the start sequence. Cordite, the relatively slow-burning explosive used in the cartridges, hasn't been manufactured since the 1960s, so Ferry Gannett starting cartridges have become scarce. The engineers at Ferry anticipated that and created a secondary starting system using compressed nitrogen. Well, during the restoration of the Gannett, John Rosnick from Praxair worked with the restoration crew to create this new method. It takes about a thousand pounds of pressure. We, had, we started out at 500 pounds, we worked up to 800 pounds, and finally we found that the best starting was at about a thousand pounds pressure and the flow rate is about 10,000 cubic feet an hour for about 30 seconds. So it's a tremendous volume of gas for a short duration at a high pressure. And uh, that's what we're using today to start this with. Our particular aeroplane is uh, 
very unique. Um, we nickname her Janet because that's the nickname we gave her, Janet the Gannet, and it's all been very dear to us over the last 10 years we've been operating her. Um, she started life, uh, they found out in the Royal Navy they needed a, a dual control aircraft that was capable of teaching their advanced pilots how to fly these aircraft because they do have some quirkiness about them. So uh, the, de the decision was made to um, build a dual control version. And you're looking at today the, the world's first. She was the prototype. And she was built in 1954 as the T2 and registered with the Royal Navy as WN365. She was painted all, all over silver with the Royal Navy training yellow stripes, which was uh, taken away later on during their career and they all went to the, sch the scheme that you see now. But the unique part about her life as the prototype was when they built her in 54, they put her in operation with the Royal Navy. And then in 1960, the ferry factory who built her decided that they would like to have her themselves. So they did a deal with the Royal uh, Navy and the British government. And uh, she's the only gannet that was ever built by ferry factory that was owned by the ferry factory and was put on a civilian register and uh, it was their own private aircraft. So um, not just stopping there with the, the unique history of the aircraft, they decided, well, now we've got her in, a, in our own ownership, we'll, we'll take her apart again, we'll, we'll, we'll update her. So they took her apart completely, and there was nothing left of her, and they rebuilt her again as the T5, with updated engines, updated systems and bringing her up to speed with the, the later capabilities that they wanted to carry on through the further years when they were going to put a, an AEW gannet in, which was just an early warning gannet. And so they thought, well, we'll update her for the future. So in roughly in 1960, they, uh, they produced her, and they produced the T5. So twice in her life she became a, a prototype. Um, and they only built eight in total trainers. Out of the 300, approximately 320 gannets in the world, they only built eight dual control versions and she was the first. So Indonesia bought her and they kept her in the United Kingdom. So they used to send over their Indonesian pilots to learn how to fly the gannet. Um, and during that year, they, they was in Indonesian ownership. And then a year later, the embargo finished between the United Kingdom and Indonesia. And so the British government decided, yes, we want to buy the airplane back. So again, she changed hands and uh, she became part of the United Kingdom again and given the designation of XT752 as you see now. And this is exactly the markings she wore um, all the way through until 1978. She remarkably is the longest serving fairy gannet in the world of all the types, starting from the prototype to her last retirement date in 78. The Admiralty then decided they would like to say farewell to the gannets. And so when they decommissioned them all, they chose her to land on the aircraft carrier Ark Royal in, in England. So they sent the ship up to Scotland where she was based in Lossiemouth. And they decided, okay, one more last landing. And so to say farewell to both the Gannets and the Ark Royal who was being scrapped, she landed one more time. And so you're looking at not only the world's first, but the world's last. Um, and through her, all her near 26, 27 year life history, she remained intact. As you see her today, through our restoration, we deliberately didn't want to destroy her history and keep her as much intact as possible. So all the skins, everything else is original. All of the rivets are later, they're not the old magnesium type, so we didn't have to do anything there. How you see her survived all the way through her 60 years, which is her birthday next month. So it's quite a, it's quite a fitting place to have her here today for you guys to see her almost on her birthday. Yeah, during, during the restoration, we, the unique thing about the aeroplane was that she never had, she'd never suffered anything un, uh, in a, in a, a de deterioration way at all. So over the, over the years, the Royal Navy had applied more and more paint and hadn't restricted her. So when we decided, well, now we've got her back to, back to home, and with all of the um, aggravation of having the aeroplane out of the way for so many years, not knowing what had happened to her, we were forced into taking her down bit by bit. So we took her apart as, as much as possible um, and 
took all the paint off and documented the paint. And, and believe it or not, when we started soda blasting it, and that we used that because it was a safe way of doing it. It took six months to do and two and a half tons of soda. But once we got it all back to bare metal, we, we, we managed layer by layer to document her original markings. And we actually found her prototype markings underneath all the paint of the, the, the yellow bars and, and the factory stencils. So we were really lucky to be able to um, copy that and use the same stencil fonts on the aeroplane. Uh, and it was just like a time capsule. And we were really, really careful about how much of this do we do without destroying her, her, her heritage. So we, we took her back to bare metal on the outside of the aircraft and all of the most important uh, operating areas. We went through her systems. But the one place we didn't touch, we didn't touch the cockpits. And we deliberately didn't want to do that, so it was a commemoration to all her pilots that flew her. So as you see, if you were to see inside her now, she has the same scratches, the same marks, and everything else from the last person who flew her in 1978 into retirement. And we have a good friend of the person, unfortunately, Commander Taylor, who flew her into retirement in 1978, died two years ago uh, from cancer, and he's not able to be, obviously, here. But his sons have sent their, their well wishes and were very emotional to me about half an hour ago on the phone saying, we wish you luck. And, uh, and that's the reason we kept it, in commemoration to the people. The veteran Gannett pilots, and most of them, believe it or not, are deaf, because they are so loud to operate inside the aircraft. And a lot of them believe that that was the, the reason that they became hard of hearing. But uh, to operate them off a deck, they would say there was such a lovely aeroplane to fly. Everybody I've spoken to have said it's such a lov lovely aeroplane to fly. And I've even flown with an, uh, uh, a very uh, well-known test pilot recently with the aircraft from the United States. And he's flown everything from ME-262s down to everything else. And uh, he turned around and said, well, can I have a go flying it? So I let him have a go flying it. And he said, this is lovely. He said, this is a lovely aeroplane. So she was a, designed as a very stable weapons platform. Um, gets off an aircraft carrier, British aircraft carrier, without using catapult. She had that much power if you needed to. And uh, the only thing you've got to watch with the aeroplane is on the landing phase, because when she goes dirty and the, the flaps come out, which are huge, and the undercarriage goes down, you have to be very careful and make, make sure you stay ahead of the drag curve. If you get to behind the drag curve and you basically start to forget and you bring the propellers back to a, a disking position, which is easy to do, you will instantly go into a bump. You're, you will lose instant height, she will stop flying. So you have to be aware of the aeroplane at all times. The Gannett's road back to restoration and renewed flight operations was interrupted by a series of mechanical and administrative challenges. It sat on the ramp at Goose Bay, Labrador for years. And then unexpectedly, the owner, Shannon Hendricks, found herself and her team scrambling to move the aircraft on very short notice. I think one of our biggest hurdles um, that we came across in a short period of time is um, bringing the Gannett back from Goose Bay, Canada. Um, she was up there for six years, and I received a phone call one day in August 2010, and it was from the Canadian Customs basically telling me that the Gannett had been up in Goose Bay far too long, um, and we needed to move her, and we needed to move her quickly. Um, and I. I think that's where the ball really started rolling for us. Um, we were very fortunate within less than four days. Um, we had Rustland International on the phone, um, heading up to Goose Bay, Canada, and then down to Minneapolis with an empty cargo. And they were willing to put the gamut in there for us, um, which they did. Um, but we had a time constraint. We had two guys coming over, one from Ohio, one from England, um, who had never met, had never worked together. Um, brought them over, brought them up to Canada, and within less than probably two days, 48 hours, um, they had the wingtips off, um, the Antonov had landed, and it was a little bit of a struggle, I think, to get her in, but they did it, um, so it was kind of wheels up from there. So since that point, every step of the way, everything that we've done has been a hurdle, but, but we've had people, great, great people that we've contacted that were willing to come in and help. Um, some of them being, like I said, Axel Noble for the paint. They came in and all of a sudden a truck showed up and the paint was there. And we asked Arm and Hammer for soda and all of a sudden we had five, six, seven loads of soda blasts, uh, or soda, uh, we for, to remove the paint. And we had soda systems who brought the machines and Heister who brought the, 
you know, for the first to be able to move things around. And just one by one by one, everybody came on board to see this progression happen for us to get here today. I guess what doesn't draw you to her? I think it's, it's everything. Her uniqueness was probably the biggest. Um, it's probably the biggest for me was her uniqueness. There's there's not another one out there like me. You, you can go around and I'm not here to knock down any other workers because they're all wonderful to go look at and see and view and, and be there. But I think for me, it's her uniqueness and how much how much it draws attention or she draws attention to herself for people to appreciate her. The restoration and flight operations of the last remaining flying fairy gannet by Shannon Hendricks, Harry O'Done, and the dedicated volunteers and crew of the Gannet ensure its history, and the efforts of its crews will not be forgotten.